you can, when you're saying something, you know it's the truth. So taste your cement. See what it tastes like. Okay. <laughs> Welcome to the Protrusive Dental Podcast, the forward-thinking podcast for dental professionals. Join us as we discuss hot topics in dentistry, clinical tips, continuing education, and adding value to your life and career with your host, Jazz Gulati. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to part two with Dr. Libby Almuzian after the first episode all about prevention. We're going to follow on a little bit more about the clinical stuff. So, for example, we're going to discuss this type of cavity, this type of presentation, uh, a deciduous molar with a cavity like that. How would a pediatric specialist manage that? We're going to talk about the use of local anesthetic in children. Is it always necessary? We're going to have a big part of the podcast episode discussing about stainless steel crowns. And we're going to discuss why GDPs are not taking routine bite wings on children. As before, there's going to be quite a few downloadables, and I'll put them on the Protrusive Dental Community. So it's going to be the Hall Crown booklet by Dundee University, uh, some more by SDSEP and a a pediatric dental dental blog that I'll put on there as well. So for those who are interested in this, they can follow up on that by joining the Protrusive Dental Community on Facebook. I'm hoping that you've noticed that the audio is a bit cleaner for this part of the episode. Um, When I switched to recording with a different software, it actually uh, downgraded the quality of the audio. So I used to get a lot of messages in the uh, initial episode saying, Jazz, how is your audio so good? What kind of setup do you have? But I feel as though the audio quality has dipped a little bit. So I apologize uh, for that, but we've got a way around it. So I'm hoping this already sounds better in your headphones, while you're on your jog, while you're cooking or in your car. So um, I'm hoping that in future episodes, unfortunately, I've got a bit of a backlog of three or four episodes before this technology with improved sound. Hat tip to Dr. Zach Caro, who helped me improve my sound. So um, in the future episodes, around about three or four episodes time from now, the entire episode hopefully will have as crisp as audio as you can hear it now. Anyway, we'll join uh, Dr. Libby in just a moment, but I want to give you a protrusive dental pearl for this episode, which is basically this. During this lockdown period, it can be quite difficult to be your usual productive self because everything is now alien. It's it's weird being at home. You know, the temptations of daytime television, daytime drinking, all these sorts of things are in the way and you may be feeling that you're not as productive. So I certainly felt that way. So one thing I started to employ is a trick by someone called Brian Tracy, who um, has numerous books which I read, and one of them I believe is called Eat That Frog. And the way he says it is, eat that frog. So what eat that frog philosophy means is when you wake up in the morning, do the most difficult thing and get it out of the way. So that thing that you really can't be bothered with, can't be asked with, you really don't want to do, do that thing first. So that's what I've started to do over the last week or so in terms of what I've been doing. And I think it's made a huge difference by eating that frog first thing in the morning. It's actually improved my day, I think. So is that his other book, uh, Getting Things Done, was really influential to me around about eight years ago when I read it or when I listened to it. And it's all about getting things done. So checklists and whatnot. But the main tip I can share with you from that book is the philosophy of mind like water. Now, what mind like water means is I used to be someone who I used to have my to-do list up here in my head. At random points throughout the day, I might be thinking, right, I've got to do A, B, C. I've got to take the bins out. I've got to uh, make sure I finish this project. I've got to make sure that I message that person, send this email. Oh, I haven't, I've got to pay that bill or whatever it is. But if you actually have a system so that your mind is like water. You don't store anything like that in your mind. Instead, you have a system, for example, for me, it was a a robust to-do list. So every one of my thoughts, every one of my tasks is on a system. And I never have to worry about my tasks because my mind is like water. So I hope that made sense. So those two tips from Brian Tracy, I hope they help you during this lockdown period. And uh, as always, I'll join you in the outro of this episode. I want to talk about now probably the most stressful thing for GDPs, which is emergency child patient. And I'm not talking trauma because trauma is always um, uh, stressful uh, because trauma is something we don't see very often, but when we see it, it's really important. And that could probably have its own 
five part episode trauma mm-hmm. camp but um yeah. let's talk about something that really used to stress me out a lot when i was um, earlier qualified and still mm-hmm. worries me when i see a, a, an emergency you know it's, it's like 1 p.m and suddenly i see at 3 p.m a child's booked in with an emergency mm-hmm. it's still something that stresses me out so um oh, yeah. you know it's, it's difficult to manage a child when they're in pain, I mean, it's, it's, it's difficult to manage a child in, in any way, but when they're in pain, when they're mm-hmm. suffering, whether it's an abscess uh, or whatever. So I want to hear some tips on managing child and prevention. And let's talk about, can I, can I share that clinical case with you? Yes. Perfect. Let's start with this. So that for those listening on the podcast, I'm going to describe the, what we're seeing. But uh, for, for, for those obviously watching on, on YouTube right now, then you, you can see this. So what we're seeing here is an upper left D on a, 10 to 10 and a half year old uh, girl. Uh, can you see that okay, Libby? Yeah, perfect. Okay. Thank you. Brilliant. So the C was removed around about uh, six months ago upon the recommendation of an orthodontist because the threes are looking like they may be ectopic. What I'd realized at this appointment was that um, having a look at the recalls, because I'd seen the patient remove the teeth and I'd seen the patient because of some uh, uh, other issue she'd actually had not been seen by any of the dentists of practice for for routine checkups so uh, one little tip there is make sure that when you see a child for emergency have they had their recalls because this should have been picked up at a recall but the patient never had a, a routine uh, examination appointment anyway she comes in complaining of a pain on chewing and when i had a look um there was no signs of abscess uh, signs of an abscess the tooth wasn't really that tender to percussion, but as you can see, there is some subgingival caries. And obviously, we know this cavity has been there for some time because there's gingival overgrowth into the cavity. Um, I've had half an hour to manage this, and you know, I put my hand up, I'm a slow dentist, half an hour to manage this in the way that I want to, in the style that I want to, and you know, giving the uh, child lots of time. That's not enough time to me in an emergency appointment. So, can you talk us through what you advise in a situation such as this? and uh, how to ultimately manage a situation like this? Um, firstly, the, the fact that it was missed um, is not surprising because what, what would have happened is it started interproximally, like we were talking about earlier. We need to be focusing more on um, interproximal cleaning. And what's happened is finally the enamels become undermined occlusally and it's broken off and you've ended up with this huge hole. So I've actually had a few instances, you know, where you get some parents who are quite upset that they're bringing their child in for regular checkups, but these things are then all of a sudden appearing and it's trying to explain to them the reasons why. So that's one hurdle because you get this parent who's coming in upset that, you know, I bring... I'm bringing my child in to see the dentist and why have they missed this to the point where it's become painful. Now, the first thing to consider is you need to actually ask, you know, do a good pain history. So when you're saying pain on biting, to me, that's, that's probably because the gingiva is being traumatized. So now it's exposed that gingiva is being traumatized. If that patient didn't have any pain due to, uh, from hot and cold, or wasn't keeping them, even if they had it to hot and cold, but it wasn't keeping them up through the night, I would say that that tooth um, could probably uh, have a stainless steel crown, okay? Mm -hmm. So I think this is something which is underutilized by GDPs. As soon as your tooth, the baby tooth, has two surfaces involved, or interproximal surface involved, I would go for a stainless steel crown. The main reason being, you cannot put on a rubber dam on a child and get adequate isolation and place a a robust composite restoration that you can guarantee will last five years, which is usually the span that you need because if they're coming in at six or seven years old and they've got a hole in, a big hole in their tooth, that tooth needs to last until it's gonna exfoliate. We're looking at five to six years. Ideally, stainless steel crown is is the the option. Now, yep. the thing is, you said this patient is ten and a half years old, okay, and they're already sort of undergoing various treatments for ortho interceptive orthodontics. Let's say. Um, my I feel as though this primary... child might be a bit delayed though, because there was no mobility mm. of the D of the E. So maybe we're looking at maybe yeah. twelve, twelve and a half by the time this one uh, go, goes away. Okay, so let's say we, we still need to keep that tooth for two years. Yep. First thing is. Why aren't GDPs taking x-rays? Why are, why are GDPs scared of taking bite wings for children? Do you know that I use 
taking a bite wink as a measure of cooperation of the child. If mm -hmm. you think that that child cannot tolerate bite wounds, how are you expecting them to tolerate treatment? Right? Absolutely. So you need to tell them, you need to say to them, we need to take a picture because I forgot my x-ray specs today. I can't see inside your tooth. We need to see how, how deep this hole is. We need to see how, it, so you're going to see quite a few things from this bite wing, but you're going to say to the child, you know, it's, it's so easy. It's just like taking a selfie. feels a little bit uncomfortable when you bite <laughs> down on it, but you can probably help me. You're really, you'll be really good at positioning it for me. And you get them to put it in their mouth with you because having having the bite wing um holder rammed into your mouth is not fun um yeah. especially not for a child but getting them to do it and say bite gently oh yeah you're doing it perfectly thank you so much you're helping me so much you get the x-ray taken quickly fantastic lots of positive reinforcement you are so amazing you know and you either say to them children younger than you manage this or you say to them you're doing better than children who are older than you just anything you need to say to get them excited about doing it. and it literally takes seconds on each side so just getting those x-rays is invaluable you're going to be can able i can i just ask them. you now because because uh, obviously uh, yeah. uh, that's amazing point and i think uh, not enough gdps are taking ready to go up for various reasons but what is the um, yeah, uh, the youngest that you start taking bite wings because i think that's the first question that everyone's thinking okay at yeah. what age should i be thinking about it is it due to eruption pattern or um what, what you might suggest yeah so um if you in the sd set guidelines i think it says from four and above so even you, if they're low risk ah see now this is where it is so if they're low risk you have no reason to think that there there is caries but if you had any doubt if there was any shadowing if the child had high risk from dietary factors that you identified they weren't brushing well then you indicate you can take a bite wing but if you have a space dentition you can see in between the teeth obviously you don't need to take a bite wing if the child is you know has uh, parent reports phenomenal diet and you know excellent brushing you can't see anything clinically that would give you any doubt then no you're not going to And maybe their them. siblings uh, who are my older have yeah. had no issues and they're good as well that's yeah. um, that's a good that's thing another, to go by as well mm -hmm. another reason but if you can see a slight shadow or you know you just feel like the the oral hygiene isn't there you know because usually when a parent brings a child in for assessment this is when they brush the best, you know? This is my best brush before I see the dentist. So if it's still not on point, then you're thinking, oh, usually it's probably worse. So um, just if you can identify any factor that would make you think, mm, are they higher risk than I think, take a bite wing. It's very low radiation. It will also help to sort of measure the cooperation of the child going forward. You know, if they can tolerate having a bite wing, they will be probably cooperative for treatment as well. And and like we said, it starts interproximally and you, you'll be surprised. Um, one of my colleagues actually did a research about it, about the difference between the clinical examination and radiographic examination. Is it so, eight times more? Because I remember a study saying that you see eight times more. <laughs> Probably. I can't remember exactly her outcome. Yeah, yeah. I'd have to go back and ask her. But she, she did that. And, and it did show that radiographically, we were finding much more caries than we were yeah. clinically. And it changes your treatment plan. Um, so taking bite wings is really important. So for this child, if this child that you had seen now at 10 and a half had had bite wings previously, that would have been spotted earlier before the, before the occlusal surface was undermined. But anyway, we're, we're always talking about, we address what situation we have. If we take yep. an x-ray of this tooth at this point, what we need to see is how much of the root is is um, resorbing because sometimes when you've got an infection in a tooth it can resorb earlier even if you know and is it worth doing heroics on a tooth which is resorbing and it's going to exfoliate earlier than its counterpart on the other side which is not infected um, so that's one thing to keep in mind another thing is to see the depth so a, a whole crown on a non-symptomatic tooth so if you're saying that the only pain she has is on biting, I would say that that's probably due to food impaction and not yes, actually... Yes, I, th I thought that as well. That was my diagnosis. Yeah, yeah. So if, if I don't have any other symptoms and that tooth has a band of dentine radiographically visible um, between the cavity and the pulp, 
I would put a stainless steel crown on that and monitor it okay. because you've, you've given it the best chance of a seal. It's, you know, you're never going to get a great seal with a composite or a GIC. Can I ask a really Putting clinical question? Yeah. In, in that mm -hmm. scenario, because we can talk about uh, placing whole crowns and some mistakes I've made in the past, but in that, in that situation, when you're seating the whole crown, the gingiva, the overgrown gingiva can trap itself between the crown and the cavity. Yeah. Do correct. you see what I mean? So, so um, my way of managing okay. would be I would anesthetize yeah. and I would um, uh, curatage or cure, uh, this gingiva away. And then mm -hmm. I'll be able to, then I feel confident I can either place restoration or in my hands, usually um, a stainless steel crown. Am I being too aggressive? Should I, should I not be worrying about this? This is me. This is my restorative dentistry you're, mind, you know. Yeah. So you're a restorative dentist. I'm pediatric dentist. I'm thinking, <laughs> how can I minimize, do the least treatment for this child? So what what I would do is, if I was really concerned about the gingiva, if it was a little bit of gingiva, I would not be concerned about that when I seat the crown, going inside the crown and just dying off and living happily ever after. If I felt like it was really overgrown, okay, I would. <laughs> I would put in a GIC, okay? So I would push the gingiva aside. I'd put some topical anesthetic. I would push the gingiva aside with a plastic instrument. I would place some GIC and allow the gingiva to grow in a more favorable manner, bring the child back the week after. So I would put in some separators if I needed as well. So uh, beside the GIC uh, filling. And what I've done is I've built up that tooth to push the gingiva away. And then the next time they come in, you just put the whole, the whole crown on. Okay. Okay. So you've sort of pushed the gingiva out of the way and you can put a whole crown on. Because um, anesthetizing a child is not ideal. Even although, you know, you've had this child has had an extraction, so they might be more cooperative. She's but, very um, good. She's fantastic. So, yeah. so that's why I was yeah. uh, happy to even consider yeah. anesthetizing, yeah. removing that gingiva and uh, placing a whole crown. But then yeah. again, look, for me, it's only in this case, it's only going to last a year and a half, two years. And I know for a mm -hmm. fact that mom's a bit anxious about having metal, which is, uh, I know we can easily talk about mm -hmm. parents that have objections to whole crowns because of the metal. I know you've told me yeah. about a white alternative before and we can, you can touch on that. Yeah. Uh, but, but in this case, what I'm probably going to do just because of parental pressure and the fact that it only has to last a year and a half, two years, I'm probably yeah. going to place the best restoration I can. <clears throat> but if she yeah. was around about two years younger, then I agree with you. I'd really try and convince the parent uh, about having a stainless steel crown. Mm -hmm. It's all, it's all, you know, there's so many factors to consider when, you, when you're doing treatment for any patient and pediatric patients, no different. So you have so many factors in play, the parent's preference, the child's preference. You know, I've had uh, parents who, who don't want the stainless steel crowns and then you, you're telling, well, you're saying, well, the alternative is that I have to give them an injection and, you know, clean it out and put a composite in and it takes time. And they don't, some of them don't realize the impact of that until they actually see it happen. And I have had parents backtrack and say, actually, you know, once they've seen their, their child be upset by having to have local, um, be upset by the whole procedure of it being long and, you know, having to have your mouth open for so long, they say, actually, actually, it's fine. Just put just put a crown on and um i mean the stainless steel crowns are, are just invaluable i think they, they do such a good job i mean the the study in 2018 um benny Hani said that it's the outcome of doing a pulpotomy okay on a tooth is the success is 98 95.3 and the success of the whole crown is like 95.8. Wow. So it's, it's pretty much up there with doing a pulpotomy so and, and so, uh, no anesthetic needed. It's just a no brainer. Yeah. It's like, why would you put your child, why would you put a child through having anesthetic, having to have a rubber dam on, all those smells of the zinc oxide and the ferric sulfate? It's like, mm -hmm. it's a no brainer to me. I would rather put a whole crown on and hope for the best usually it is the best than put a child through all of that and do you know what they come out they're so excited oh, look at me with my iron man tooth with my princess crown you know mm -hmm. um 
and they show it off to people they get excited and again with the parents the parents can get upset because they feel like when people look in their child's mouth that they're a failure that look my child has needed metal in his mouth because his teeth are so bad but again it's saying to them we use these crowns for many reasons some some teeth don't form properly and that's why we have to cover them with these things lots of children have them these days for different reasons it isn't just because of holes in your teeth and just making them feel a bit reassured that you know that nobody's judging them for that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i think yeah. there's two that, that's a really good point about managing a parent and, and reassuring them but i think there's two reasons why uh, there may be more you might you probably you know more than that but uh, i think there are two reasons as a gdp why some a lot of gdps are not using stainless steel crowns uh, one is uh, not really their fault lack of training it wasn't taught but at the time that they're at dem school uh, so lack of training is, is one and then therefore they never get the hands-on experience so if you can recommend anything for, for them to, to, to a channels for them to learn and the other one is probably not having the kit because you know what um, it, the kit is like an, I don't know, 350 pounds 400 pounds I think it's from 3m I personally think it's a, it's a great investment because uh, your restorations will last longer less emergencies less fillings falling out so uh, I think number two we can really dismiss and I say you know speak to your principal get them to stop being so cheap and buy the bloody um, stainless steel crowns. So I think really yeah. what you need to tackle is uh, the, the, the first point, lack of placement. training. How... Mm -hmm. so, so in terms of placement, the, there's the whole crown, um, there's like a, a, a guide that you can, you can get off the internet. University of easy. Dundee, but, right? Uh, University of Dundee. Yeah, University of Dundee. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that, that's an, I, I would say read through that and practice. Um, what I tend to do is put separators. So I use the um, elastomeric orthodontic separators, the small blue ones. And what I do is, at the, so you do an appointment and then you can have the second appointment a couple of days later or a week later, it's up to you. Sort of, I wouldn't go more than a week because usually they'll, the space will be created and they'll fall out and then you start to lose the space. But what that does is it just gives you a tooth that sat on its own space really easy to fit and cement a crown and then the teeth will go back to normal occlusion afterwards. Um, I think it's it's about not being scared to do it. So the first appointment putting in the separators is it feels almost the same as having the crown on. So it's like an introduction to the child. So I put in the separators and uh, you can use floss or you can use separating pliers. Um, some children might get scared from seeing separated pliers, but actually how I introduce it is I say, these are my magic fingers because my fingers are too fat to hold this tiny donut. So it's a donut, it's not a separate. Mm, but of donut, course they get, you, you get a smirk from them when you go, do you want i'm gonna put some donuts in your mouth and they go what is this dentist talking about you know <laughs> so i'm like not sugar donuts do you really think i'd give you sugar donuts so yeah we're gonna pop in these donuts they're so tiny i'm gonna use my magic fingers and look the magic fingers can stretch it and and squeeze it in between your teeth and we're gonna wiggle so i'm gonna put it in in between your teeth you have to wiggle as well so you get them to wiggle and you're wiggling just to place it in that contact point. Once it's in, you say, it's gonna feel like you've got an, a piece of apple skin or something stuck in between your teeth. If it feels like that, it means it's right. Brilliant. So it's reassuring them that that sensation is the one that we're looking for. If you tell them you're not gonna feel it, 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 you won't even notice it's there. If you say that, and then they feel it's there, they feel that you're lying to them. Whereas if you tell them up front, this is what it's going to feel like. It might feel like this. It might feel like that. Some people don't notice it at all. Within a few days, you'll have forgotten about it. They usually forget about it as soon as they walk out the clinic, to be honest. But it's just reassuring them that this is, oh, if it feels like that, fabulous. We've done the job right. Well done. You know, just positive, always an upbeat. Um, so please. Maybe that is so routine. That is so routine for you because you, you do this day in day out. Yeah. But, oh my God, that apple skin analogy is. Just, I have to just stay, say that apple skin analogy is amazing. Mm -hmm. So uh, I but think that's really good. It, it's just all about being truthful with children. Children know when you're lying. So even when you're giving them local, um, you don't say you're not going to feel a thing. You say it's going to feel like, and then you give them something that it feels like so I'll, I'll go into that when we talk about local but going back to the separators so i place the separators because it's going to help me to size and fit the crown much easier 
and it's going to help the child. It's like an acclimatization for them. So you can put fluoride and put in some separators in one appointment. That's acclimatization for them. The next time they come in, you're going to say, oh, have you looked after my donuts for me? Or did you eat them? And uh, sometimes they'll have fallen out. Sometimes there's space created. Sometimes there isn't. Um, the, if you can get a separator in, you could probably get the crown in, but it'll need a bit of a push. So if, if you know, if the, you've lost the separator, but you have been able to place the separator there, the space that you need for the crown is less, but it, it might need a bit of a push. And it's knowing whether the child would tolerate that or not. If you feel that they're too anxious, then place a separator again, bring them back sooner, or place a thicker separator and bring them back sooner so it doesn't fall out. Um, and uh, when you fit the crown, uh, it's about getting a click. So if it clicks on, you say to them, oh, it clicked, perfect, that's what we're looking for. And also joking around with them, what size do you think you are? What size tooth are you? Because you know we have sizes from two through to seven. And I'll say, what size are your feet? Do you think your tooth is as big as your feet? <laughs> um, let's see, and it's just like getting a new pair of shoes. We have to try a few sizes to see which one fits. And I you know, they'll it. say, does it hurt? I'll say, no, does it hurt when you put a hat on your head? Okay, no. It just feels like putting a hat on your head. And I'll take the crown and maybe put it on their pinky finger. See, just like, it's just like putting it like that. And um, once I've got the right size, um, of course, for airway protection, what I do is I cut a piece of hat band, you know, like it's almost like a plaster strip. Mm -hmm. And I attach it to the tooth and I say, this is a mermaid tail. So we're going to have a tooth with a mermaid tail or a fish tail or a dinosaur tail, whatever you want to call it. And I say that so that I don't drop it. I'm really bad at dropping things. So you're just explaining as you're going and let's try it on. You've tried it on. It's the right size, right? Let's get the um, glue, the glue. And this is really special loopy glue made by mm -hmm. the tooth fairy and Mr. Maker. So Mr. Maker is like this popular crafting guy on TV, on CBBs. Okay. And most kids know it, I think. Okay. But anyway, I say, I say the tooth. So I'm chatting away while I'm doing all this. Yeah, the tooth fairy, Mr. Maker get together and they make this special glue for us. Um, it doesn't taste very good, but if you, um, uh, once I've stuffed it on, I'll wipe away the extra bits so you don't have to taste it. So it's all about reassuring them that you're doing the best to make them comfortable. You stick it on, you give them a cut and roll, you ask them to bite down, you say, now I want you to bite as hard as you can like a tiger. You can do a practice of it beforehand, saying when we've got the uh, Iron Man tooth on, I'm going to ask you to bite on this. You're going to bite as hard as you can like this, like a tiger, like a lion, you know, just all those analogies. And you're cheering them on when they're doing it. And then you wipe away the excess. I use a wet uh, gauze because um, I use uh, GIC to cement it, which doesn't taste very nice. Um, can taste some of them are a bit acidic. I've actually, I actually taste my cements. Because <laughs> <laughs> I thought, amazing. you know, somebody told me, somebody told me, um, one of my supervisors uh, when I was training said, oh, it tastes like salt. We say it tastes like salt and vinegar. Chris, I think it says it in the manual, actually. It tastes like, tell the child it tastes like salt. That's what I say Chris. as well. Yeah. I thought, great. But have you ever tasted it? No. No. So actually, I tasted a few, and one of them tastes really lemony. One of them tastes like salt and vinegar crisp. But it's, it's just like, so that you can, when you're saying something, you know it's the truth. So taste your cement. See what it tastes like. Okay? <laughs> like, and, you can, and I say to them, I say to them, I know because I've tasted it. Anyway, so we stuck it down. We've got them to bite. We've washed, we wiped away the excess. You can go in with a bit of floss. Oh, here's our tooth fairy floss. Let's check everything is clean um i want to make sure it's really shiny for you now do you want that tail the mermaid tail on or do you want me to take it off do you want to walk around with the tooth with the tail that's why i asked and mm -hmm. it's just all distraction because now they've got this new thing in their mouth and it feels weird it's putting a bit of pressure on their gingiva if it's done if it's done well so you're trying to distract them this whole time from actually linking the feeling to their brain and getting upset so you you're just constantly talking and saying things to them to distract them and you'll say to them it'll feel funny because it's something new in your mouth and i always say to them especially if they're a bit older you know your mouth is so sensitive even if you have a grain of sand in it your, your teeth can sense that so imagine you've got a brand new tooth and you know it's amazing and i want you to keep it shiny for me 
and at this point fantastic you've done a great job off the chair reward and well, well, two things i wanted to because obviously you move on you moved on to a reward now which is great but two things yeah. i want to ask about the the nitty-gritty clinical things which i like to, yeah. to, to, to to drop one is okay. when i've placed a whole crown or stainless steel crown um should i be able to always be able to floss because it's so tight sometimes is it some in scenarios where i won't be able to floss to help clean the cement uh, if so how do you manage that um it is possible and if the child is really upset i would advise the parent and say there's still some cement left um which will probably be cleaned away by brushing but we can check it the next time they come in because I don't want to sit there and be so pedantic about a piece of GIC stuck in between the teeth, which is going to leach fluoride onto the tooth beside it. Fantastic. You know, mm -hmm. It's like an added bonus for me. But I'm not going to sit there and be pedantic about um, getting rid of the floss because that will probably upset the child. Yeah, and it's yeah just that's my biggest more worry. Time. Yeah. So if you, I would say try with a pro, flick it out. If you can't, let's still so there's a couple of ways I manage it. The first way is if they tolerate the three in one and suction, I will, as soon as I've seated it, go at it with the three in one water and air at the same time, blast it through the interproximal and get it, you know, hoovered up by the dental nurse. And then I will go through with the floss. What I find is because the the uh, GIC cement is still viscous, it washes away really quickly, and then mm -hmm. you don't have to do as much cleanup. If they don't tolerate the three in one, I will use a damp gauze straight away after, so straight away go through with the damp gauze and get in there with the floss as soon as you can. If you can't, due to cooperation or whatever reason, um, and it stays there and it's interproximal, if you can't flick it out with the uh, probe, I would just settle for it the way it is and then just say it will brush away gradually and you know and try and get in there next time with some flosses especially if you're seeing them again okay so and which cement which cement are you using um previously i used um fuji one um which i find is good because it's quite uh fluid and you sometimes you need that bit of extra time with kids as well because you know you might have a bit of a faff around until they let you seat it properly you don't want something too quick setting um can, and can dentists use using, fuji 2 or fuji 9 can they can they use that should they use that um i think it just depends on the work because that's what they have that's what they have in their drawers right like a gic yeah. i'm just thinking for, for, for those starting to use the technique, should they, is it just worth so since getting I a moved, proprietary since, cement? Um, since I, I think, try it, see how viscous it is. I'm not too familiar with the other two. I think because I was in the pediatric department and we just had that as standard. Um, now I'm using Reliax, um, but it's the one that mixes as you squeeze it through the tube. Okay. Not, I can double check which one it is exactly, mm -hmm. but that one it gives a bit of a longer working time um, and is viscous. So I think it's you just need a bit of a longer working time to make sure that you've got that extra leeway to see because what you don't want is the child loses corpora corporation or something or they don't bite down straight away or you know there's you're unable to seat it properly immediately and you don't want that GIC to set quickly. And then well, based on what you the said situation. there, then it, it, it makes sense. Uh, uh, if it was a, a situation where you, you only have Fuji 2 or Fuji 9, Fuji 2 is the, the RMGIC like your version, right? Well, it's dual mm. cure. So it's way more runny. And without the light, mm. it can take a long time to set, which might make yeah. sense for those who only have the option to, to use a Fuji 2 rather than the Fuji yeah. 9, which should be quicker setting and it's far more viscous. So no, I, I no. think the so Fuji 2 sounds better. Fuji 2 would be the better option. Yeah, mm. definitely. Brilliant. So we talked about uh, that. And then the other thing I was going to say is that um, when I've placed a whole crown, let's say on the upper left D or E, then um, to reassure those who may be trying this technique for the first time that actually when they bite together, it can be alarming as a restorative dentist to see someone and they've got a massive like opening and the contrast of side is three or four millimeters opening. But every time they yeah. come back a few more weeks later, the occlusion just magically settles. Yeah. So just to uh, so speak on that. Yeah, take, I think they said it takes around a week for a child's occlusion to settle. What you have to to bear in mind is they're not adults, they're not fully grown, they're in mixed dentition, they will go through phases where different parts of their occlusion are open, you know, tight contact, uh, spaced, you know, they, they're just going through so many 
changes that actually it doesn't make it doesn't impact them significantly and a sore mm. tooth would impact them much more significantly you know not being able to eat on that tooth. but but it's worth but mentioning actually, isn't it for those doing it for the first time because yeah. it actually can be as a dip for the first time i did it as a student i was like oh my gosh how is this ever going to yeah. settle and it does if you if you do <clears> feel like it's a significant um open bite and what you would do is monitor it so if if over the course of let's say a month it didn't settle or the child was complaining that it was bothering them, then you could um, take off the crown. So you'd have to cut it off and redo it. So, but mm. usually I haven't had any cases where that's been the case. I think it's a good tip also, and please correct me if I'm wrong, baby, is never mm. do opposing teeth and never do an upper left E and a low left E whole crown at the same time, because the opening would just be ridiculous, right? Is that, is yeah. that still so something that you follow? The rule, yeah. So the rule is that you can do two in the same arch on opposite sides so you can do d and d upper you can do d and d lower you can do e, e upper e d upper at the same time d e lower at the same time but you can't do contralateral so like you can't do top and bottom on opposite sides and you can't do the same side okay. upper and lower okay so that's all in the whole crown manual so if you, if you have a read through that, that's all. It's all I, I, I will stick that on because I think it's a really fantastic resource. Um, I know that Dental Tubules are setting up a, a Tubules Live for Hall Crown. So uh, they're, okay. they're going to have study clubs all over the UK where people will get, dentists will get to uh, place Hall Crowns on models and stuff. So that there is that coming mm -hmm. on. And, I, and I'll, I'll share the date with you as well, Libby, because for those GDPs in your okay. network, because there are uh, some study clubs in Scotland, uh, and, and maybe, you know, uh, if you can go to one of them, be, be a mentor for, for, for these uh, GDPs, maybe that might be a good thing. So uh, I'll yeah. be in touch with you uh, about that. Uh, okay. So let's talk about something. Uh, we're going to have to wrap it up eventually, but let's talk about a, a clinical point where local anesthetic and children. I've mm -hmm. done it both ways uh, in my earlier years uh, when I used to work in, in mixed practice, let's say, uh, and time is of the essence. I've done it before. I was like, no, it's okay. We'll be okay with that anesthetic. And you're there for the fast hand piece, just doing what you can. And then with the, the slow hand piece, the rose head burr, and then you just restore to the best of your ability uh, without anesthetic. And I've done it also, and I'm more routinely now, I'm using anesthetic. What is your take and what is your advice for GDPs about local anesthetic use when it comes to restorations because for whole crowns we, we, we were advocating not to use la but for yeah. restorations we are obviously extractions mostly if we use la but we're talking about fillings yeah. fillings so the thing the thing with la and um even with whole crowns by the way you can use a topical just around the gingiva if the child is is quite uncomfortable if you just paint a bit of topical anesthetic around the gingival margin that can help you with the seating just to make it a bit more comfortable but um, topical anesthetic has another uh, use, which is to acclimatize a child. So most children, what they hate about the local anesthetic is how it feels afterwards. So when they've had it, they don't understand that feeling. So if they've never had local before and you numb them up and all of a sudden their face feels really weird and they, they keep touching it, they keep biting it because they don't understand or know how to process this. They can actually process pain better than they can process that sensation of being numb because mm -hmm. it's something brand new. Um, so sometimes uh, if you know that next time they're going to come in, you, you might use local anesthetic. If you give them some topical anesthetic on a cotton roll and you ask them to put it on their tongue and say, oh, doesn't your tongue feel funny now? Doesn't it feel weird? That's because it's gone to sleep. And usually when your tongue is asleep, you are asleep. But this time you are awake and your tongue is asleep. That's why it feels weird. So that's why I say to them. And then it's about reassuring them that it's going to go back to normal. So you're going to say to them, I know it feels weird now, but in a few minutes, it's going to go back to normal. Now, after a few minutes, when it starts to go back to normal, they say, she was telling the truth. It's going to mm -hmm. go back to normal. They believe you. OK. Even if they go home and then they realize, oh, it's gone back to normal. You know, they say it's reinforcing the message that you're giving them. Then when you need to give them local. And you tell, they, they have this really strange sensation. You reassure them and say, do you remember when we did it with the top plant, with the top plant anesthetic, how it went back to normal with the magic jelly? Um, it's going to feel the same again. It's going to go back to normal. And it's just because it's asleep, but it'll wake up later. So that's sort of one hurdle with giving them local anesthetic. 
sometimes in a child who has a non-painful tooth, so let's say they have caries in their tooth, it's not painful to them, okay? At the moment, they're not complaining of pain, but you can see the cavity, it needs to be restored. That's the most common um, scenario, and that's exactly what I want to yeah, answer for GDPs, absolutely. Yeah. So, so I think high speed with water is very difficult to tolerate without LA because you've got the added coldness, which will stimulate the pulp and just the cold water along with the high speed is, is going to bring about some reaction. So going at it first with a slow speed is actually probably more favorable. So if you were going to go without LA, you would you can say to the child first so the thing is if they know what to expect you're more likely to get a better outcome so if you say to them halfway through once they've started to have pain that actually i can give you something to make your pain go away they're not going to be cooperative but if you say to them from the beginning i can make your tooth sleepy which would feel a bit uncomfortable to begin with but then your tooth would be asleep and we could clean it really quickly and well or we could try with the small buzzy toothbrush first and if it feels uncomfortable, then I can give you the, med the special jelly and medicine to make it sleepy so that you'll be comfortable. But it's, and you say some people feel comfortable with the buzzy toothbrush without having the sleepy medicine and others don't. So do mm -hmm. you want to try? So it's giving them the options. And then also, you know, they feel a bit in control um, and you give them a signal. So you say, if it feels uncomfortable, I want you to put up your left hand and it's always the left hand. You say, it's the, you say the left hand so you can hit my nurse, not me. <laughs> <laughs> so I say, you can hit Chloe, but don't hit me. And I say, and if you put your hand up, I'm going to make sure it's safe and then I'll stop. So you don't say, I'm going to stop straight away. So you don't give them unrealistic expectations. You, say, you make them feel that you care about them. So you're saying, I will make sure it's safe and I will stop as soon as it's safe for me to stop once I've seen your hand signal. Okay. And you have to follow their hand signal, even if it gets really annoying, even if they're doing it every two minutes. If they start, if they start to do it too much and you feel like they're just doing it for the sake of doing it, then you, you go for another tactic, which is to say, we'll, we'll use the buzzy toothbrush for five seconds and then we'll stop. So we'll count to five and then we'll stop. And you do it in counts of five and then you say, okay, let's increase it to 10. Now, a child in okay. pain, you'll realize they're in pain. You'll know when it's just, you know, you can tell when somebody's in pain. You'll see their legs twitch. You'll see their, you know, some, some kind of reaction, bodily reaction. And if you, you can also use the slow speed on their nail. You can yep, draw a that. Yeah, so you can use the slow speed on the nail and just explain to them how it's going to feel. It's going to feel bumpy. It's going to be a bit noisy. It, it might feel a bit bumpy on your teeth. It might feel a bit tickly. Um, so I think you can do some restorations without local. And the reason being that now we know that if we seal in caries, so if we're sealing in the caries, we've got a good clean margin that's actually more important than going deep and taking out every single bit of affected dentine. So if you are taking away the soft dentine and you are leaving affected dentine that isn't, isn't soft, but you have a clean periphery of the cavity and you can get a good seal on that, then I think that is sufficient to, to give a good outcome restoration wise i don't think you're going to get any better by making sure that you're digging deeper and digging deeper might need local so it's kind of balancing up it's very different for each child and some children once they've felt it with without the local they will prefer having the local and it's just gauging that but like i said just introducing it from the beginning that it's an option and i will use it if you want me to and that makes them feel in control when they're asking for something then they're more likely to accept it as well I, I really like that, giving them the control and choice. And I, I like your tips about the the hand signal and, and following that. A tactic I use quite a bit is, okay, we're going to do 10 second bursts and we'll see how many bursts we need. So I'll count down. And as you mentioned, that, that's been quite effective for you as well. So that's brilliant. In terms of uh, clinical questions, I want to wrap up in terms of, because there's so much value uh, that we could talk about here. Uh, Okay, let's see. So my connection was unstable, but I'll fix that. So two questions I'm going to wrap up. I'll, I'll, I'll ask you them in a way and then you can answer them. 
one will be at what point do you think a child what's a threshold where you think okay this this child really needs to be sent to you uh, uh for example uh, you can contrast that with some some children that you see and really you think oh, this could have been managed in primary care primary care quite easily so you can uh, you know touch on those yeah. both things so at what point should they be uh, being referred to a, a pediatric uh, specialist or a pediatric dentist uh, and the other question i want to ask you is what's the one tip you're going to leave everyone with uh, for your one main big tip you can be a repeat tip for what you said in terms of how to be better on monday morning uh, with children so those two things when we should, when should we refer essentially and your overarching dr libby's tooth fairy tip so um, in terms of referring, I think you don't want to push a child to the point where they are upset. If you're getting to the point where you cannot do your treatment without the child being visibly upset and the parent agitated, then you need to stop. And there's no shame in stopping and saying, I think that this child would benefit from having a more specialized approach and a more uh, and more time and you know just a different approach so i think that sometimes um dentists will push a child and make them upset but then they have to realize that afterwards that child is going to regress and not be able to have dental treatment so i have some children who are severely anxious and you look in their mouth and they've got crowns and they've got restorations and you think well they've had all of this done but they've had it done under duress where they feel mm -hmm. like they're pressured into having it rather than them being cooperative and being able to have that treatment comfortably. So I think one, I think a few of the signs are if the child, you know, is, is visibly upset and cries when you're trying to do anything, doesn't want to get on the chair. The parent can be, uh, if a parent is densely anxious, highly likely their child is. So if yeah. you know that their parent, the parent doesn't like going to the dentist and they'll come and say, I'm really scared of the dentist, that, that means the child is going to be put off as well. So, and children who ask lots of questions. So it's like a delaying tactic. The, so you get these like seven, eight year olds and the, every time you come near them, they'll, wait, wait, wait. And they'll ask you like 10 questions. Wait, I've got another question. I've got another question. Mm, so I these are that. all Definitely. tactics. Right. They're all tactics for them to delay the treatment. And it's just a sign that they are anxious. And if you cannot give them the time that they need to get comfortable and to build that trust, then refer it to somebody who can. Because you're not doing the patient any favors, even if they only need one treatment done. And you know you can push them and just get it done that day. You're not doing them any favors in the long term. So I would say that's that's when you should be referring these patients. And another thing is when you see something that needs more inputs like MIH, so molar incisor hypermineralization, that's something that needs to be looked at, not with, with eyes that are looking at those teeth and thinking, what can I do for them today? But actually they need more long-term monitoring and treatment. And if it's out, outside of your scope, then I would say, please refer to a pediatric dentist because there are windows of opportunity for treatment which will minimize long-term needs for that child and you don't want to be the cause of them missing out on those opportunities to have a better outcome in the long term and i'm gonna put you know, uh, on their special uh, needs special needs um i'm gonna, sorry to interrupt you there um, i've got a <clears throat> really good pdf um i, I believe it's from guys hospital about uh, it's addressed to parents about yes. mih and your child so i'm going to include that in the file section as well because i think I, I send that to parents and they find it really educational Jazz, that is what I give parents when, when I diagnose MIH. That is the leaflet that I emailed them. I say, this is what you need to know because it's just a simplified version. But what I don't like seeing, okay, and I don't think I've, I've, we've touched on this, but I've, I've seen quite a lot of parents who are coming into me who have been to the GDP and have been shamed or guilted about the caries in their child's sixes when the child has only, you know, the teeth have just erupted, it is not caries, it's caries yep. because of MIH. And we need to recognize that. And, you know, uh, I've put together just a list of the signs that this is MIH and not 
caries, okay? So warning signs are if they've had hypoplastic ease, okay? So sometimes we get the ease are hypoplastic, following that we get the MIH, um, or they've had no caries in the primary dentition. So you get this child in who's just got their their sixes through, you know, a year ago or six months ago, and they've got caries in it, but they've never had caries in their primary teeth. That doesn't make any sense to me. There's nothing that could have changed significantly diet-wise or health-wise, unless there is a significant event in their life. But there's nothing to say, you know, if you've had no caries in the primary dentition, why are you getting caries in your sixes? Okay, so that's something which I, I wanted to bring it, attention to GDPs. And the other thing is when you spot uh, white opacities on the front teeth, on the incisors, you know, that's also another warning sign for um, MIH uh, and creamy patches on the molars. So what you want to do at that stage is you do want a specialist input because you don't want that child to miss out on the opportunity of having the ideal treatment for them to minimize their treatment in the long term. Okay. And um, I mean, it's it's very prevalent now. It's forty percent. Some studies are saying it's forty percent the prevalence of uh, MIH. So it's something that we should all be regularly looking out for and checking up on. It's it's something that, and I don't want to shame anyone because um, I feel as though just at the point when I was at dental school, we were getting taught about MIH. But I feel as though three or four years above me, maybe they that was when they weren't. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, the pediatric dentists weren't teaching so much about MIH. Absolutely. When I went on my uh, elective and I met these Canadian dentists who, still, um, who I'm still in touch with today, lovely people, great dentists, and, and they had no idea about, and they were 25 years experience, they had no idea about MIH. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's something that a lot of dentists don't know about. In my own practice where I worked in, um, when I sent everyone this handout, they were like, you know, the hygienist and the dentist had no idea about MIH. So you're totally yeah. right. We should be looking out for the signs and uh, I'm going to put some more information for the listeners about MIH okay. so that they don't have that situation that they're confusing it for clinical mm -hmm. caries because it just doesn't match up. And the thing is, these, um, the sixes that we're talking about that are affected, they are uh, sometimes sensitive. And so what happens is the child actually won't brush those back teeth because they're they're too sensitive to the cold water. So one of the, the great tips is to just say to the parents, use warm water when you're brushing, which is just mm. something so simple, but it can be a game changer. And then the second thing is because the, the enamel, um, the quality of the enamel isn't the same, they actually, the uh, sealants don't stick as well to them. So that's another reason why we're not able to protect them. And also if you're, doing a restoration on these sixes, they aren't numbed up as easily as normal sixes. So you've got this sort of this vicious circle that they can't brush them because they're sore, but then they, they're more poor enamel, they're getting holes in them. So it, I think these, this is the kind of thing that you need to refer to a pediatric dentist because it's not a straightforward um, putting sealants on and put, you know doing restorations it's it's looking at the long term for that child what is best so I think I, I would I love it when uh, I get referrals for MIH because I know that I can give them the best chance going possibly you know going forward I mean the the severity of MIH probably has huge bearing on your treatment plan because if it's mild yeah. and there's no breakdown and you've got a, a good yeah. cooperative patient with minimal uh, orthodontic needs that would benefit from a six removal that's the kind of uh, child is saying okay we've noticed it your dentist your dentist done a good job to identify it you're yeah. gonna have to be a bit more preventive than the average child let's say yeah. but uh, thankfully we don't need to do it but on the other end it's when there's severe breakdown uh, mm -hmm. then you have that window to have them removed, but the sevens take the place. And that's yeah. where and it's need... important to get those referrals in at the right time. Yeah. And to get an orthodontic opinion at the right time. And, you know, it might be a case of needing to temporize these teeth until the right moment to take them out. So this is all things that need to be decided by a pediatric dentist with an orthodontist. So it, it is out, outside of the scope of a, a general dentist. So what age, like let's say they're six and they're coming through and there's already a breakdown. Do we need to refer at age six or wait until age eight or? Any tooth that you see with breakdown, refer. Because what's going to happen is the orthodontist is either going to say, you know, if they look like they have a class two tendency, you're going to say, maybe I want to keep these teeth around until they're 12 and all of the adult teeth are through and I'm going to use that space 
um, for orthodontic treatment, you know. So it, it, it varies from patient to patient. But I would say if, if it's mildly affected and you feel like you can manage it with sealants and there's no breakdown, keep that child under your care. If there's any breakdown, at a young age especially, you need to refer them in because even the window of opportunity for um, closing, uh, for extracting and anticipating spontaneous uh, space closure, we're looking at the window between nine and 11, depending on how, how advanced they are. Some children are, you know, their dental age is much higher than their chronological age and they can, you know, that window can be missed because we're not referring them early enough. But if they're coming in at age six or seven, and you can take an OPT and you can see what is developing. Do they have any missing teeth? Do they have, you know, this is all things, factors that we need to take into consideration and how, how much post-eruptive breakdown there is. Um, I would say take clinical photos if you can. And if it is breaking down quite quickly, put a stainless steel crown on it, take a picture of it put a stainless steel crown on it so then you can show that the dentist that you refer on to say this is what it looked like I was proactive and I put a stainless steel crown on it because I didn't want it to break down further because some of them they get to the point where you can't even put a stainless steel crown on them because they're so broken down and the only option you have is to extract it even if it's not the optimal time so we don't want the child to get to that point basically we want to be able to pick and choose when when and if we're going to extract Amazing. Thank you so much, Libby. And to wrap up, the final tip that you want to share to, to GDPs. Final tip. Have fun. Actually enjoy your patients. Be excited, you know. Go at the weekend and watch a kid's movie. Take your niece, nephew, son, daughter, whoever. Go with your friend. Go watch a kid's movie so that on Monday morning when you come in, you can say, have you seen the latest movie? Oh, it's amazing, you know, and just have something to talk to them about and just enjoy it because kids, kids will, you know, they'll feed off that excitement that you have and they'll be excited to see you and that will make you in turn excited to see them and just enjoy it. Kids are great. Kids are so much fun. And, you know, I know they come into you with pain, but the reward that you will have, what you will feel after you've treated them and they've, they're out of that pain and you see how much they trust you and, um, you know, are thankful to you and the parents are grateful will make you feel amazing. Fantastic. So I love it. When you, when you said that, I punched the air. So I don't think the video caught yeah. that, but that's a, a, a lovely uh, ending point to, to, to finish on. Um, Libby, how can we follow all the, the tips that you give? Because you're always giving so many tips to GDPs. Can you yeah. please tell us all your social media channels uh, so we, how we can follow your progress yeah. and your career and all the lovely things that you're doing? So I'm doing, um, I have an Instagram page at Dr. Libby. And I have my uh, page on Facebook, which is a bit more active. Well, I post on both of them, but my videos and things are more on, uh, I do Facebook live videos and things like that on my Facebook, which is Dr. Libby's Tooth Fairy Tips. And I'm sure you'll put a link for me, Jazz. Um, but those two pages are actually aimed towards parents more than towards dentists. But I've found that dentists like to follow it because it gives them, um, they like to see how I word things to parents and also just how to bring about the topic. So I'll post about, you know, uh, what I see in the supermarket that annoys me, you know, the things that are speaking to parents saying no added sugar, tricking them into thinking they're doing the best for their child, you know, one of your five a day, but actually it sticks to your teeth and rots them, you know, so we get lots of patients who have otherwise healthy diets and they're having health health foods in inverted commas um but actually they're very sugar and stick to the teeth and what i say about uh, natural sugars to parents and kids is the sugar bugs don't care where the sugar came from they will eat it anyway and poop anyway so i say to them <laughs> the sugar the sugar bugs don't look at natural sugar and go, oh no, stand back. This is natural. We're going to back off. They'll eat it anyway. So um, just those uh, oral health messages, that's, uh, it'll help you as a dentist to be able to spread them in a more um, uh, empathetic way. And, you know, I post my personal stories. Uh, one of the reasons why I have my um, Facebook page is actually for me to to appear human to the children I see. So I say to the parents, follow my page. They say, oh, I'm not really into Facebook. I say, I know, but 
if I'm not going to see your child for six months, if within those six months they see a few of my posts and see me going out with my girls and see me that, it makes me more familiar to them. And when they come back in, they know a bit of what I've been doing and they will um, not feel, you know, they won't have forgotten me and it'll just make them still be in that comfort zone with me. Um, just keeping up to date and you know and it helps to motivate them as well with brushing I put up um, videos of brushing and things like that as well um, there is a tooth fair there is a blog which I have started to follow which is really good um, on Facebook which is aimed towards dentists and I think it's called tooth uh, fair fair read tooth fair read I'll um, okay I'll email you I'll send you the link for that please do that's just you know, anything of value you want to share Yep. Yeah, so that's a new one that started that's aimed more towards dentists. And um, they posted an excellent summary of MIH uh, just last week. And I shared it because I think it, it was an amazing, concise, to the point, what we need to be noticing, you know, what dentists need to be noticing. So I'll, I'll give you the link for that. Um, just, uh, yeah, follow my page. Um, you'll see that I post mixed things, not all dental related, sometimes about my life. And um, yeah, I think people find it interesting. I hope. Absolutely, I, I I love your post always. So uh, I think my, my my message to you, Libby, is keep doing your thing. Uh, I think you're helping so many dentists, and you're showing that you're having fun. Uh, and I think. I would, I've been saying to my speakers, uh, you know, you are a massive role model to dentists, especially to, to, to you know, to all dentists, but women dentists, you know, we, we need more women uh, like you in dentistry, sharing, teaching, spreading the word. So uh, on both accounts, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. I think my listeners uh, over the two episodes thank have you. learned so, so much. And I'm just in love with all your analogies uh, and I can't wait to use them with children. So thanks so much for making Fantastic. me a better pediatric dentist and all the listeners who were listening. Uh, and it's been a pleasure having you on. Thank you so much. Thanks for your time. And thanks for your amazing podcast as well. It's been a privilege. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening all the way to the end. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I, uh, I did. I really enjoyed uh, speaking to Dr. Libby on both sort of uh, parts of the episode. The first one being prevention. The second one just now, as you listen to, a bit more clinical. So if you enjoyed it, please follow Dr. Libby and what she's uh, doing on social media. She's doing some great things. Uh, I've got some really cool episodes lined up going ahead. Some great guests coming up, for example. I'm just going to drop this one in there. Chris Orr, amongst many others, have agreed to come on. I've got a great episode about complete dentures coming up as well but all of that you have to wait for around about once a week i'm averaging at the moment uh, so again really appreciate you listening and if you like if you like it please tell a friend tell a dentist put a five-star review on um, your platform that you listen to it on whether it's apple or google or stitcher or whatever and uh, give me some feedback if there's anything i can improve for you let me know thank you